For centuries, man dreamt of soaring into the air. This was the stuff of myths and legends, and it also preoccupied serious men of science. It seemed reasonable to try and imitate the flight of birds. According to Greek mythology, Daedalus and Icarus tried to escape from captivity on Crete with wings made of birds' feathers. But for Icarus, the attempt ended in tragedy. Many centuries were to pass before man was truly able to take to the air. Being able to fly is perhaps man's oldest dream. The principle of buoyancy was discovered in classical times. Archimedes noted that if a body is less dense than the water in which it is immersed, a force pushes it upwards. If its density is greater than that of the water, the body will sink. If its density is the same as that of the water, it will float. Leonardo da Vinci applied this principle to air and focused his attention on flying machines. To mark the coronation of Pope Leo X, he painted pictures of the saints on canvas and paper bags. Filled with hot air, they floated upwards for a while. In 1670, Count Lana di Terzi, a Jesuit priest, suspected that spheres from which the air had been evacuated would rise up. He designed a vacuum airship, raised on the lighter-than-air principle, but it would never have flown. Like many other similar ideas, for years it was forgotten about. Joseph Michel and Jacques-Étienne Montgolfier were the sons of a paper manufacturer from Annonay in the south of France. Educated in chemistry, physics and architecture, they eventually took over their father's firm. Appointed as suppliers to the court meant financial security, so the Montgolfiers were able to devote much of their time to research. They invented a calorimeter and a method of manufacturing transparent paper that earned them an outstanding reputation in the paper trade. But at a very early stage, Joseph began to take an interest in flight. He read of a gas discovered in 1766 by Henry Cavendish that was said to be 14 times lighter than air. Its name, hydrogen. This fired his imagination. Joseph filled small paper spheres with hydrogen and released them. They rose up but sank again after only a few meters because within seconds the gas escaped through the paper envelope. So Joseph decided to abandon his experiments with hydrogen. Yet his interest was aroused once more while staying in Avignon. A shirt hung out to dry next to the fire puffed up through the hot air from the flames. Joseph immediately wrote to his brother, Etienne, prepare a supply of wax paper and string and you will see the most amazing things. But Joseph didn't understand that it was heat that was making the air expand and rise. He thought the smoke was what he'd long been searching for. What's more, he reckoned the more pungent the smell, the greater the lift the smoke provided. So, for his experiments, he burnt a mixture of damp straw and chopped up wool. We can only imagine the stench. But the initial tests soon proved successful, and in the first few months of 1783, the Montgolfiers constantly improved their balloons. They tried out different types of envelope, increased the volume, and watched their unmanned balloons soar higher and higher, up to 300 metres. Then, in Annonay, the Montgolfier brothers showed the assembled crowds how air, heated by fire, could lift a 33-metre-high balloon more than 1,000 metres into the air and carry it two kilometres. This achievement found swift recognition. News of it quickly reached the Académie des Sciences, the National Academy of Science in Paris. The Academy commissioned a young physicist by the name of Jacques-Alexandre Charles to repeat the experiment to prove that such a flight was indeed possible. Charles, however, was misled by a newspaper article on the Montgolfier brothers' experiment. 
The brothers, it claimed, had managed to produce a gas that was lighter than air and thus made balloons capable of flight. In those days, hydrogen was the only gas known to have such a property. So Charles was certain that this was what the Montgolfiers had used. This misconception set him on a path that led to the development of a totally different kind of balloon. Now a race to conquer the air began. Charles made swift progress thanks to a new method of manufacturing rubber-coated silk. Since the material was less permeable to gas, he'd solved the problem that had forced Joseph Montgolfier to abandon his experiments with hydrogen. Within a few weeks, Charles had built a round balloon with a diameter of four meters, a dwarf compared with the Montgolfier's giant balloon. Filled with hydrogen, though, it had far greater lift. In August 1783, Charles launched his gas balloon on the site where the Eiffel Tower stands today. The spectators quickly lost sight of the balloon, which landed some 25 kilometers outside Paris. In the history of technology, a concept has rarely been thought up by a single person. At some stage, the time is ripe for an idea because so much knowledge has been accumulated that the solution to a problem simply presents itself. That's why almost simultaneously in 1783, two different types of balloon were designed, which are still named after their inventors. Hot air balloons are called Montgolfier, while gas balloons are referred to as Charlier. But back then, no human being had ever flown in a balloon. The French king, Louis XVI, summoned the Montgolfier brothers to Paris so he could inspect their invention. In doing so, he created competition between the two systems. With a gas balloon, the lifting gas, hydrogen for example, consists of smaller molecules than the surrounding air. So the density of the gas is lower than that of the air outside the balloon. And since, in physics, systems strive to balance pressure, the balloon will continue to rise until the pressure inside the envelope is equal to that outside it. With a hot air balloon, the air is heated up by fire. This gives the individual molecules greater energy, so they move around more quickly. The hot air expands, its density decreases, and the balloon rises. Through their greater experience, on September the 19th, 1783, the Montgolfier brothers were able to decide the balloon contest in their favour. The whole of Paris had gathered in the gardens of Versailles Palace for a memorable occasion. They'd come to see the Montgolfier's balloon soar aloft with a crew on board. Not a human crew, mind you. That was thought too dangerous. So the first creatures to take off in a balloon were a cockerel, a duck, and a sheep. Their flight lasted eight minutes. After that success, the Montgolfiers wanted to build a balloon to carry human passengers. The king insisted they use prisoners awaiting execution who would be pardoned if they survived. But François Pilatre de Rosier, an aristocrat who was the youngest member of the Academy of Science, was indignant at the thought of condemned men reaping the glory of making the first ever manned flight. So he volunteered his services. And he managed to convince the king to change his mind, thanks to help from the influential Marquis d'Alande, who was allowed to join him as co-passenger. Although no official announcement had been made about the flight, on the morning of November the 21st, thousands had gathered on the outskirts of Paris. Hot air from a blazing pit streamed into the balloon, which inflated in all its blue and gold splendor. 22 meters high, it measured almost 15 meters across and had a volume of 2,000 cubic meters. Pilatre de Rosier and the Marquis d'Alande took their places on opposite sides of the balloon so as to balance each other out. Helpers then released the tethering ropes. At 1.54 p.m., the balloon soared slowly but majestically into the sky. With a light northwesterly wind blowing, it drifted over the park at Versailles towards the city. 
A short time later, after the two men on board had covered a distance of just over eight kilometres, they landed gently between two windmills in Krulebab. The contest had thus been decided once and for all. They were the first men ever to have flown. But only ten days later, Professor Charles followed suit to the cheers of 300,000 spectators at Versailles. Charles and his mechanic, Noel Robert, rose silently into the air in their gas balloon. After a flight of two and a half hours, they landed safely in Nessel, 36 kilometres away. In 1784, the Montgolfier brothers also embarked on a longer flight. One of the seven passengers was Joseph Montgolfier on what was to be his first and only ascent in a balloon. Thereafter, the Montgolfiers lost interest in balloon flight. Joseph put a concept by Leonardo da Vinci into practice by making the first parachute jump from a tower. Jacques became a high-ranking civil servant. In the years that followed, several balloons were launched. They reached heights of up to 3,000 metres. But it wasn't long before the first tragedy occurred. On June the 15th, 1785, Pilatre de Rosier was killed trying to cross the English Channel in a combined hot air and gas balloon. De Rosier, named after him, exploded soon after takeoff. He thus became aviation's first fatality. But that could not halt the development of the balloon. Bigger and bigger distances were covered and greater and greater heights reached. It was also realised that the different air currents prevailing at different altitudes made it possible to change direction, at least indirectly, by rising or sinking. Attempts were also made to design balloons that could be steered by means of sails, rudders or even with ducks tethered as draft animals. In the early 20th century, motorised zeppelins solved the steering problem. It was at this time that scientists also began to use gas balloons to study the atmosphere. On May the 27th, 1931, Swiss physicist Auguste Picard reached the staggering altitude of 15,785 metres in a gas balloon. The ascent took him only half an hour. For the first time, man had entered the stratosphere and was able to record important information on the air in various strata. Auguste Picard's grandnephew, Bertrand, circumnavigated the globe in a gas balloon. His Breitling Orbiter 3 landed after 20 days and a distance of 45,000 kilometres. Even today, climate research would be inconceivable without gas balloons. And the story of the hot air balloon isn't yet over, although these days hot air balloons are used mainly for recreational purposes. But one thing has remained unchanged since the days of the Montgolfier brothers. As soon as a balloon is lifted off the ground, there is only one thing that determines the direction in which it will travel. And that is the wind.